Welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I'm very happy to be talking with Keith Campbell. Keith is a psychologist, mostly known for his research on narcissism. He has a bachelor's from the University of California, Berkeley, master's, University of California, San Diego, and a PhD from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He's well published in scientific literature on narcissism predominantly and personality theory in general. He is author of a handful of books, including The Narcissism Epidemic, Living in the Age of Entitlement with Gene Twangy, and the more recent book, The New Science of Narcissism, Understanding One of the Greatest Psychological Challenges of Our Time and What You Can Do About It. Uh, and that's what we talk about uh, in this conversation. Uh, I wanted to get Keith on because, you know, he I kind of know him as the the guy on studying narcissism. Narcissism is a term that's thrown around um, very colloquially um, within society. And uh, there's a lot of kind of watering down and, you know, everyone, you know, just uses it as a kind of a fill in for, you know, someone that's, you know, an asshole or whatever. And, and that's not quite right. And so, um, you know, and of course, people don't have narcissistic personality disorder walking around, you know, it's, it's less than one to 2% of the population. So I wanted to just get him on and just give us the full kind of download on, on what narcissism is, the science behind it, um, and how we can understand it for our lives. We start by talking about uh, how we define narcissism and the three types, uh, such as grandiose, vulnerable, and uh, narcissistic personality disorder. We talk about state versus trait versus disorder. We talk about three theoretical models, so psychodynamic, humanistic, and biopsychosocial. We talk about an additional four models of narcissism. We talk about general personality traits. We mostly stay on the big five um, and some of the personality measures that, that go along with, with studying uh, personality. We talk about some of the motives of individuals with narcissistic traits. Uh, we do talk about narcissistic personality disorder. We talk about the dark triad, the light triad, and the energetic triad. We talk about narcissism in relationships, in dating, uh, leadership, and yes, on social media. Uh, and then we kind of end the conversation talking about how can we manage narcissism. Uh, again, uh, I think it's important to use our terms and our words correctly. Uh, there's a lot of trendy words that get thrown about uh, in psychology or in sociology or what have you. And, you know, not everyone's a narcissist. Um, and even people that have traits, that doesn't mean that, you know, there are adaptive elements of, of narcissism and dark triad. And so I think it's important to really uh, be as close and as accurate to, to the science that we have at the moment to, to really use our words correctly and our terms and our ideas. And uh, Keith is, is doing absolutely fantastic work and has been for, for many years. And so now I bring you Keith Campbell. I'm here with W. Keith Campbell. Keith, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I'm uh, greatly looking forward to uh, speaking with you. Oh, thanks for having me. It'd be fun. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I've been told by a few people that you know a few things about uh, narcissism uh, in terms of the, the literature and the research yeah. on it. You've written a few books on it. So I'm excited about that because it's definitely something that gets talked about. So before we get into it, why don't you just tell listeners um, who you are, your background, what you do, uh, just kind of give us the brief thumbnail sketch of yourself. Sure. I'm a, my name is Keith Campbell. I'm a social personality psychologist, which I do research for a living. I'm not a clinician. I'm not a shrink. I, you know, I study people sort of analytically. Uh, I'm a professor at the University of Georgia. I've been studying narcissism a uh, long time, really since grad school. Mm. So it's the interest of mine. Yeah. And that's, you just kind of got into it and then you just stayed there. You just kind of, well, just... it's, you know how it is in academia. If you study the thing that just keeps, it's mm -hmm. like you hit the gold mine, hit uh -huh. the vein in the gold <laughs> mine. And unfortunately with narcissism, it was, you know, theoretical. And then it was the Columbine shooting and then it was uh, selfies mm -hmm. and then it was social media mm -hmm. and then it was, you know, politics. And so it just, 
it just kind of kept, you know, it keeps morphing. It just keeps, keeps yeah, growing. Yeah, unfortunately, it's just it just kept growing as a topic, um, or else it, I wouldn't have kept doing it. It just I got sort of fortunate in in a weird, really unfortunate way that narcissism was a growth industry about thirty years ago. Yeah, you wrote a book with. Um, was it what you wrote with Gene, right? You wrote yeah. the narcissism pandemic or epidemic? Narcissism or? epidemic. Uh-huh. Yeah. With Gene yeah. Twangy. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and that was really a book looking at culture and looking at sort of cultural indicators of narcissism and how those have changed over history and, and recently in the U S and, um, and this book is more about narcissism as a construct and how it works and more the basic psychology. Mm-hmm. I remember reading that book um, when it came out, and it was good. And then I, I reread some of it um, <clears throat> before, before, uh, before you know, we we talked. And and it's interesting how fast some of that stuff dated. And I was reading the beginning. I was like, oh my goodness! They were talking about you know, two thousand seven, two thousand eight. We we're still talking about MySpace, and it's like, wow, that feels like centuries ago now. It- Yes, it, it culture, when you start looking at culture, it changes so quickly. And I always thought what struck me back in the day was, wow, we went from Woodstock to punk rock in seven years, or really mm-hmm. five years. Mm-hmm. And what you saw writing that book about culture was that when I look back at like you, I'm like, my God, it was a different world. So it different. doesn't seem to be, but it's changed that much. Yes. And when I was writing the narcissism epidemic, comparing it to my childhood without social media, you know, we had one phone in the house. It, it's just uh, the, the change is sort of exponential and, and we're not we're sort of ill suited to it, I think. Yeah. So, it, it, as you said, that book is really kind of about some of the many of the cultural things. And there's some of that in this new book. But the, the new book or the newer book is The New Science of Narcissism. Um, and this one is it's you and someone else is on this as well. Uh, yeah, it's, it's Carolyn Chris, who's a friend. She's a journalist. Mm-hmm. I just I need help, man. Writing. <laughs> I get tired. Listen, listen I'm, with, I'm with you. I hear you. <laughs> um, She's great. Yeah, so so a lot of it is is really really good. I like the the way you you outlined it. So you start the book, which is always a, it's a really good place to start by defining narcissism, right? So, you know, it goes without saying that it's a, a very overused uh, uh, term in our society. People use it kind of colloquially, but how do you usually define narcissism? And and maybe you'll you can explain these kind of three types as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, the core of narcissism is you have a inflated sense of yourself and and maybe lack empathy so you think you're better than other people and you not really don't have empathetic relationships so much and so that that's the core but really we use it in three ways in psychology and the first way which is the most common way which is narcissism is the personality trait so it's the idea that we all have some narcissism but some people have a lot more and some people a lot less And that's the form of narcissism we call grandiose narcissism, which is somebody who is confident, energetic, assertive, uh, sometimes charming, extroverted, but also uh, lacking in empathy, somewhat self-centered or self-absorbed with a sense of entitlement. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's an interesting character who's sort of a jerk, but it's an energized, sometimes likable and charming jerk. And these are why we end up these grandiose narcissists make such good, you know, movie characters or politicians or preachers, because they have that energy that goes, you know, this extroversion that goes with it. Mm -hmm. So there's this grandiose form of narcissism. And this, like I said, the more politician ex-boyfriend form, and then this other form of narcissism where you have the same core of like, I'm entitled, I'm better than, than other people, I'm special. But at the same time, I'm a little insecure. I lack self-esteem. I'm not that energized. And we call that vulnerable narcissism. Mm-hmm. So it's somebody that you might think of as a little depressed, but in their mind, they're thinking, man, you know, I should be that. I should be the president of the of this high school, even mm-hmm. though I didn't try or, you know, I should be a politician or I should have this. Everyone should admire my creative genius, even though I never really wrote anything. Mm-hmm. So it's this more vulnerable form. And that vulnerable form ends up more in clinical settings because mm-hmm. they go in there because they're not feeling good about themselves. Mm-hmm. So they make, so there are these two general forms of narcissism. And again, these are traits, which means we all have some of it. And, uh, and then there's some people at the extreme. 
And then the third form of narcissism is NPD or narcissistic personality disorder, which is the psychiatric condition. Uh, and what happens with narcissistic personality disorder is your narcissism, and it's it's primarily grandiose, but also can have some vulnerability, gets so extreme that it starts impairing your life significantly in a mm -hmm. clinically significant way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Well, you're so arrogant and it's so inflexible, you can't turn it on or off that you ruin your marriage because whenever you come home, you're bragging to your kids. You're talking about yourself. You don't listen to your wife's issues. You don't give in the relationship. It falls apart. Or maybe you go to work and you're so overconfident that you start making risky decisions and you drive the company down. Mm. So it, uh, the narcissistic personality disorder is narcissism sort of on steroids. Mm -hmm. And what most people estimate is about one or two percent of the population at any time would have NPD. Mm. So all this said, when most people use the word narcissism, they really are just using it to say asshole. Right. Or maybe asshole who was mean to me or broke up with me or is my boss. And there's a core of truth to that because having been disagreeable and callous and lacking empathy and being manipulative, that's sort of key of narcissism. But it's more than just that. It's this kind of you're an asshole, but you're also kind of energized and charming and would be a good leader and look good on TV. And I like you when I meet you. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, I have a few, a few follow ups here. So I guess on the, I want to start with, um, well, I should ask this first before I ask about vulnerable narcissism. So <clears throat> you've kind of alluded to it. So in, in, in psychology, uh, we have things where we describe states, we have things, traits, and then we have things that are disorders, if you will. So I think you can explain the difference here, but you know, states are usually very transient, right? I can be, you know, in a, in a, in a good mood, I can be in a good state, if you will. And then, you know, if I, you know, uh, if I, if I burn the taco shells later on for dinner tonight, you know, I might be in a bad state, right? There's yeah. these very transient kinds of things. Traits are a little bit more pervasive, no? Right. So there's a little bit, yeah. have uh, something that's a kind of, um, it's like you know one of the one of the 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 tracks on the on the railroad track, right? It's not the whole thing, but it's one of it's kind yeah. of sort of there. And then you have like you're saying the disorder, um, yeah. which is which is really quite rare. I mean, people will will talk about narcissistic personality disorder often, but it is, I mean, rare in the sense. I mean, it's a two percent. You know, is probably you know at, at, you know the maximum maybe a little bit more depends on the data so any, anything you want to say i guess about how we understand right. narcissism whether it's any of these type these forms that yeah. have states traits and then kind of full-blown disorder yeah absolutely so you're right so that the idea of a state is it's something that's somewhat transient and a mood is a classic state where i'm in a good mood i'm in a bad mood and People can be sort of grandiose and vulnerable in states. You actually see that with vulnerable narcissism. They'll go into these sort of moods where they're really grandiose and the moods where they're not. So you can have that uh, instability. Uh, but typically when we measure and study narcissism, we're talking about a trait. And a trait, which is what you're suggesting, is you're consistent across time and situation in your behavior, attitudes, thoughts, or feelings. So somebody who's narcissistic is going to be sort of a self-centered and attention-seeking and maybe exhibitionistic mm. uh, when they're in the classroom. They're going to be that way at work. They're going to be that way on a date. And they're going to be that way in six months. And they were that way six months ago. There's stability to it. Mm. And uh, not that people can't change, but it's, the, it's more gradual change. With the disorder, the way I think about it, is it's a manifestation of a trait so it's somebody with a trait of narcissism but something's going on that takes that trait and either makes it more inflexible or more extreme mm -hmm. i don't know what that is it could be cocaine and lots of success it could be early childhood trauma maybe that gets the personality stuck yeah um you know, who knows what mm -hmm. it is, but I think it's maybe, I think it's more than a trait at that level because it's so fixed, mm -hmm. but it's trait like, mm -hmm. and, and the definition of a disorder is asked a, a personality disorder. You have to see it before, you know, adolescence. So you, yeah. it has to have some durability. Yeah. Uh, 
It, well, personality well, disorders, y- yeah, personality disorders typically are, are very elusive in trying to really kind of pin them down. They're, they're very, you kind of know it or s- feel it when you see it, but it's very hard sometimes to describe it. We have at least two major uh, systems of how we do it, and, and both are, well, one's not widely accepted and one is very outdated. So it's, <laughs> they're, they're, they're very, they're, they're, <laughs> well <headache. put. laughs> they're well headache. put. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I want to I want to ask about the vulnerable piece real quick. So the vulnerable narcissism you were talking about. Most people will know the grandiose narcissism, yeah. but maybe just if you if you can, you know, whatever whatever seems salient here. How how solid is the data that we that we have all, that supports this concept of vulnerable narcissism? Because I could see this getting a little muddied. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So how do we think about what a personality trait or personality construct is well it's kind of a historical traditional art it's not mm-hmm. like we can go and look open up your brain and go well there's that trait and that trait that it's 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 sociocultural yeah and if you look at the history of writing and theory and narcissism these two forms would pop up over and over so it was you know overt and covert or thick-skinned mm-hmm. and thin-skinned or exhibitionistic and i forget the opposite or spoiled or special child and and crying child or whatever Mm -hmm. so you had these two different faces of narcissism that always appeared and and so i think both forms have some legitimacy in terms of you know the construct and they have some value in our academic or psychological tradition and then you go with the question of measurement and when you start doing that, you can measure vulnerable narcissism, but what you're capturing a whole lot of is neuroticism. So it's a lot of insecurity. It's a lot of anxiety, a lot of that instability in self. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so you're capturing a lot of that along with the antagonism. Mm-hmm. So it, in some ways, too, vulnerable narcissism almost seems like core to all or a whole lot of personality issues because mm-hmm. it's self-centered neuroticism or self-centered anxiety and depression like mm-hmm. i'm depressed but i'm also self-centered mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's yeah, not no. A, yeah no that's, i think that's a good way to, to say it. i think that seeing where you know kind of what you're explaining like it pops up throughout the literature or, or throughout certain uh, theoretical orientations you know it gives this kind of you know i i want to say there's these kind of it's a duality of sorts but it's this way of of trying to understand that there's i would say it as externalized internalized right <laughs> that's how i oh, kind of well, see it you know, you know what <laughs> that's actually correct yeah mm-hmm. yeah because it you see like the very you know the very obvious stuff that you know i'm sure many people can think of many you know famous you know actors or politicians like yeah that's the grandiose narcissism but the vulnerable narcissism is also is is kind of more reflected back at oneself in this kind of internalized way that's that's kind of how i was i was seeing it so i think that that's helpful to know that um there's a kind of uh arc or history here of that uh yeah Uh, yeah. i'm gonna add one more thing because you're getting a little heavy so i'll just get heavier (laughs) so the challenge was theoretically is people thought well maybe these are the same person so what they Mm -hmm. started saying was the person on the grandiose on the outside was a vulnerable narcissist on the inside Mm -hmm. and every once in a while the poll might change Mm. and so that was one of these you know sort of psychodynamic approaches which is Mm -hmm. really interesting Mm-hmm. But when you look at the data, it doesn't seem that way. It's not like uh, who's that? The new superhero I like is really an art. The surgeon superhero, uh, Doctor uh, Strange, Strange. Yeah. super narcissistic. I mm-hmm. I love that. Mm-hmm. I saw him on a plane recently. I got all excited. Oh, that's cool. Um, but uh, <laughs> but he's not deep down thinking he's a loser. Yeah. I mean, that's it's just not like that in real life. In most cases, some mm-hmm. some so. But that was how people resolved it a long time. They said this was one construct with two poles but one's hidden Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah i i I mean you could see the logic in that but i i would agree it seems to be that there is a kind of um you know you're talking about two different types is what it was what it seems like yeah so let's just kind of briefly uh we won't have to sit on this for long because i want to get to some of the the science of some of this stuff but um so you mentioned some of the origins of how we conceptualize this now i bring this up because you mentioned three models We'll, we'll stay on one uh but I guess the the reason I bring this up is because uh, when people think of narcissistic or or any type of narcissism, they usually see it as it's used as a pejorative. It's it's yeah. a very negative thing, um, and it certainly 
it is and can be. Um, but I think that there are definitely adaptive ways of understanding this, so understanding narcissism. And we'll talk about that later because uh, you, you talk about it in your book towards the end. So there's these three, you usually you cite off three main models. There's many models that talk about this, but psychodynamic, humanistic, and biopsychosocial. Um, on the psychodynamic, so a lot of folks talked about this, Kernberg, um, Freud mentioned it himself, and then Heinz Kohut, who, who, was, who did self-psychology, and he did a kind of renaissance, if you will, of <clears throat> Freud's drive theory in the 60s, 70s and then the early 80s. And so he had these ideas about how he would define narcissism, right? So he would he talked about, um, it gets a little in the weeds here, so I'll try and, and just give the cursory view of this, but he, he thought about objects and object love, right? We all have objects that could be um, another person, it could be an actual object or a thing that has some representative value for us, and that we need it to have object love that we receive as an important way for developing the self. So hence, Kohut's self-psychology was, how do people have a healthier sense of self, whatever that is. And so he dealt with this idea of, of narcissism as this development of self. And so he believed that object love develops out of narcissism, right? And so, so the narcissism will disappear when object love appears. So for example, if you're receiving care from a parent or a sibling or a peer or the things that you need, um, some type of mirroring, he would say, when that appears, there's less of it where you're having to do more of the extra work work of from whatever you're working with, right? So we need is because we're social, we need this way from others to give our development of the self, right? And so um, I guess, how do you understand some of either Kohut or some of the psychodynamic folks um, in object relations, and then just kind of where that went with like humanistic and then biopsychosocial and where we're at now kind of theoretically? Yeah. Um yeah, thank you so much for setting that up because I said, you know, I'd be before my dissertation, I was all over this stuff. That's been a long time and it gets so but I think those key points you raise are important. And you see it in Freud's work and Kohut's work, is that narcissism is sort of the core of the kid. And or it feels it can be a core. And so I always say with people, if you have young kids and they're running around naked, say, look at me, look mm -hmm. at my artwork. Mm -hmm. Like that's cool. That's like healthy narcissism. You know, that's part mm -hmm. of growing up and and the challenge is how do you let go of that narcissism mm -hmm. and become a healthy person and i think one argument is that you're making is that there's some sort of attachment object and this is where i get confused and so by loving that object who loves you back sort of mm -hmm. mirrors your and you get self-worth from being loved you can let go of that love of yourself yeah, there's, so a, there's, there's it's internalized and it's and it's also there's a sublimation that goes on. So it's like, okay, yes, I'm getting what I need, and you're confirming things about me about how I'm developing. So now I don't need to just use myself. I can I can have an adaptive way of getting the the cues about myself, right? So if I if I if a kid does something and the mom smiles and she gives him a reward or gives him a hug, that's developing who you are, your identity, yourself. And then that kind of crystallizes of sorts for, for within you. And you don't need to have any of this unhealthy narcissism. Yeah, you're building a system. So instead of the love just going for you and cycling back, it cycles to somebody else, your right. parent, and then it cycles back to you and you end up build, finding a boundary for you and a boundary for them. And right. you become a healthy adult. I mean, I get the theory. I forget all the psychoanalytic <laughs> no, that's, lingo. No, that's, that's totally but, fine. I, but I think the, the important point of like, it's self-love is good but and this goes i'm thinking of a lot of the work i used to do on relationships self-love if you're loving yourself too much it interferes with loving other people mm -hmm. and i think that's a challenge because sometimes we get the message you know love yourself before you love others i think mm -hmm. it's you know don't have a bunch of trauma you're dealing with um so i think there's a there's an idea that as development goes you have to give up yourself to love somebody else but that will come back to you mm -hmm. in the in the relationship I kind of see it like a pulley system, right? 
So you're, you're, is there, there's a sort of give and take here that happens because of the, the social elements of our, of our, of our nature. And of course, many of the instinctual drives that we have, it's all of finding this kind of homeostasis okay. of, okay, how do I, yes, I love myself and I take care of myself, right? Cause you'll have people that will do the, the opposite. Well, it's not about me. I don't want to do that. And then they're all about other people and that's not very good either in, in, in extreme forms. Yeah. And so it's, it's, it's a kind of a balance. It's like a pulling I, system. I that is that argument is so old. I love it because that's <laughs> yeah. the cla- that's Schopenhauer's porcupine. So that's Schopenhauer, right, yeah. this argument of these two porcupines, and they got mm-hmm. cold, they'd huddle together, then they'd start poking each other, so they'd push apart. <laughs> and there's this idea of sort of optimal connection. You know, right. you want to have a self, but you know, give up some though for relationship. And Freud cited that in his work. He mm-hmm. used he he cited Schopenhauer's porcupines talking about this self identity development. That's mm-hmm. great. Yeah. 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 It's it's really important. I mean, the sense of self is important and what that looks like. But again, there's a there's a balance. So then, uh, humanistic is is again uh, it's an offshoot out of the analytic tradition. Obviously, they have a lot of um, investment in. Um, uh, freedom, authenticity, growth, um, yeah. growth um, a, a lot of these things, and and which is which is great. And there's a it's a little bit more, I wouldn't say an abstraction. I mean, I think when you look at the work of you know Maslow or Rogers or uh, any of these guys, that it was more of how do you how do you try to understand some of the existential anxieties that you have, and how do you have that kind of uh integrated sense of self right where things aren't these kind of pieces of sorts oh very much integrating both sides it's very nietzschean kind of yes uh, yeah. you know uh, understanding the sh- shadow work or something mm-hmm, maybe a way mm-hmm, of thinking mm-hmm. about it yeah and i i it's sort of interesting historically i think it was rogers was working with primates and correct mm. me if it was maslow because i might be wrong i used to walk by this primate center when i was at wisconsin and um and he started looking at alpha monkeys and that sort of that idea got linked with narcissism in a way and self-actualization mm-hmm. so in his model the the line between narcissism and self-actualization wasn't like they were opposing mm-hmm. it was kind of like you you have the energy of self but it become it flowers into something you know, mm-hmm. more integrated or more connected with the world, maybe. Absolutely. I might be reading too much into it there. No, no, I think you're I taking think, me I, down heavy roads. I, I think that's right. I think that that's, that's, that's kind of the, how it opens up or how there's a kind of uncovering there of where it could extend out to. I think that's right. And then I think probably more recently you have a biopsychosocial model, which is a kind of integration, right? Yeah. Of like we got our body, we have some sense of ourselves or our emotions or our mental states and then our social states. And there's a kind of, way of trying to say hey look all of this stuff is connected all of the it's not just the brain and like outside of itself it's connected with how it functions with our body which connects with our relationships as a kind of integrative approach absolutely so it needs to you know where does narcissism come from well it's in your genetics Mm -hmm. uh comes from your genetics but it also comes from your parenting but it also comes from your culture from your environment from Mm -hmm. your i mean your physicality how you exercise could play a role your social roles so all these things are kind of spinning back and forth on each other shaping behavior which Mm -hmm. is why it's hard to predict but Mm -hmm. but that's kind of how we think about it it's very complicated yeah so and and this stuff is in everything and it's everywhere and so there you you give in the book these kind of four models so we've talked about one of them kind of by chance right we talked about the nomological network so these traits and states yeah yeah and then you there's the self-regulatory the and then obviously evo psych is here and then culture so maybe just kind of talk about the other three oh sure so um when we think about narcissism as self a self-regulatory system this is very much like a simplified psychoanalytic approach, mm. which social psychologists and personality psychologists often take, which is how is the individual able to gain self-esteem or gain status or gain social stature? What are they doing? How do they regulate their life? So what you see with narcissism is self-enhancement, which are any opportunity to make themselves look good, they'll take. So it might be get an attractive spouse, wear expensive clothes, Mm -hmm. get a fancy car, talk Mm -hmm. about yourself, get Mm -hmm. on television. Mm -hmm. So all those things will make somebody look high in status, which will feed back to the the narcissist's ego and make them feel good. 
Somebody mm-hmm. call it, there's a lot of terms for this, narcissistic supply, whatever. Mm-hmm. But it's the idea that you're constantly making yourself feel good by doing things. Mm-hmm. And it makes life very hard because you always have to do those things to look good. As I say, like if you if you if you think you're a nine and you're really a seven, <laughs> you gotta put in a lot of work to, to inflate. <laughs> That's right. With <laughs> with vulnerable narcissism, you see more of self-protection. It's not mm. so much, hey, there's a chance for me to be TV and I can be a leader. Mm. It's more, I don't want people to see through me. I don't want people to find out that I'm really this dumb or mm-hmm. um you know, I don't want to be shamed by somebody. So it's much more a protective approach. But in both those ways, you're sort of, you're regulating the self. You're regulating how positive you see yourself, your self esteem, and how you feel about yourself. Mm. And and what about with the evolutionary psychology kind of a uh, uh, model? So, yeah. So the the question with any trait, you know, something like narcissism or any other one is is why does it exist? If it if it's sort of bad, if we don't really not, like narcissism, is there some sort of role it played in the adaptive environment? The you know, one hundred fifty thousand to fifty thousand years ago, that this trait might have stuck around. Yeah. And so what people tend to look at in that area is they look at mating behavior they look at uh maybe cheating behavior things things along those lines and what you see with narcissism is is pretty clear links to short-term mating meaning they be happy with one night stands or okay with relationships without commitment um higher number of sexual partners Lots of things, evolutionary psychologists would go, yeah, that's kind of a marker of something that might have been led to some sort of reproductive fitness because you're, you know, you're just having more sexual relationships. You're probably reproducing more, at least at certain times, mm-hmm. um, all to also put you at risk of being killed. So that that's what I think the evolutionary take would be, would be um, probably short-term mating, but also it could be resource extraction when things are unstable. Mm. So in stable environments, if you're kind of a self-serving, entitled, and narcissistic, your friends will just beat you down. They just don't want people like that. But if things are unstable, maybe you have an opportunity to take advantage of people. So maybe it worked in certain environments that narcissism really, you know, when things are unstable or under pressure. I don't know. I mean, this is all just stove stories because evolution. Mm -hmm. So I think the mating evidence is reasonable. um, And, and other stuff, it's, it's more kind of guessing. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think, you know, evolutionary psychology is, uh, I think very powerful, but it definitely has its critics as well. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, and what about the cultural piece, right? So, it's, yeah, I think so people yeah. overemphasize this sometimes, but I think it's definitely a, a key factor though. Yeah. I think, you know, uh, a, a culture can, you know, put the self at the center, kind of be a more individualistic culture, uh, a culture where people are more isolated, more atomized, live on their own, create their own identities, find their own meaning. It's kind of a modern Western industrial culture. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. what you see are those more um, those more um, individualized cultures at times can start promoting this sort of runaway individualism, which looks like narcissism. So you see high narcissism and uh in urban environments, you see it in uh, more competitive environments because you're in an environment where people don't know you. So you put on an act, you go meet people, you can go, you just need to do stuff. If you're in a mm. small town where everyone knew you since you were six, mm. you don't have to put on an act. You just yeah. live your life. Everyone knows. So that's one piece you get culturally. The other piece we're seeing, which is coming out in data more recently, which is pretty interesting, is low trust societies. So when a society gets more low in trust, you can't really trust each other, trust your neighbors as much. Um, People become more narcissistic because they become more tough-minded, less compassionate, a little more self-centered. I've got to get what's mine and what's for my family. So Mm. I think that's another piece of it as well. Mm. Before we go to the kind of some of the aspects of personalities and some of the stuff I really enjoy discussing, it might be boring for listeners, but uh, <laughs> you talk about the trifurcated model of, of narcissism. Yeah. 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 So just tell us about that real quick. Uh, okay. So if you look at personality in general, there's specific models of personality, like let's look at narcissism. Let's look at self-esteem. Um, 
and there's more general models of personality. And the most commonly used, I think the most well-studied general model of personality is called the big five. Right suggesting there are five large buckets of traits that describe a real good chunk of human personality. So what you see within narcissism is you take those five traits, which I won't go into unless you want, um, but you we'll, find we'll just, three- we'll just, I've uh, talked about it before. You want before. me to do it real fast? No, but just, I've talked about show. it before, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's agreeableness, openness to experience, conscientiousness, uh, uh, neuroticism, and extroversion, introversion. Yes. And sometimes Just, people have the six one. What's the six one? Oh, that's like uh, honesty. They'll do a hexaco model. Yeah. They'll put yeah. in honesty, humility, but it's a long, that's a nerd discussion. Yeah, that's a real nerd we discussion. Yeah. We're, we're talking about uh, the big five. <laughs> big five spell ocean. That's yeah. the easiest way, or canoe, but mm -hmm. ocean's easy. Openness, conscientious, extroversion, agreeableness, neuroticism. But of those five traits, three really stand out for narcissism. For both grandiose and vulnerable narcissism, the key, kind of the core aspect of it is, is low agreeableness or antagonism. Mm -hmm. It's a lack of compassion, it's self-centeredness, it's dishonesty, uh, manipulativeness, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So it's this interpersonal callousness. So that's the core. Mm -hmm. But if you take that core and you marry it with extroversion, which mm -hmm. when we talk about extroversion is both sort of sociability, but also assertiveness, drive, ambition, leadership. That's grandiose narcissism. So that's two of them. If you take that core of agreeableness and you marry it with neuroticism, which is instability of the self, anxiety, and depression, you end up with vulnerable narcissism. Mm. So the trifurcated nar ver uh, model takes grandiose and vulnerable narcissism and decomposes them into mm. neuroticism, agreeableness, and uh, mm. extroversion. So I guess one of the things that makes this, I guess, important is that, you know, which we can get into here is, is that the big five is one of the most um, replicated, thankfully, um, and has high reliability and validity. It has a lot of cross-cultural stuff. It has some longitudinal stuff. Really good data on all the big points that you want in terms of how we understand personality. Others, um, other models of personality do not have this, which would make it um, less reliable and it would make it less uh it, less of something to hang your hat on so obviously the big one that people probably think of is you know the myers-briggs which yeah um you know i'll say it, you don't have to say it i mean i think myers-briggs is a bunch of bullshit but you know i think that it's <laughs> it doesn't hold scientifically or, or statistically i should say i think some of the principles that that carl jung had are fine just kind of in a more cerebral sense but when you're talking about hard science it's pretty shitty. It just doesn't hold. And so there's, there's problems with it. And so you have other alternatives, uh, or I would say more of a standard such as the big five. And so having this I form model of uh, trifurcated model of narcissism mapping onto that is, um, I think very appealing. Yeah, absolutely. I, I sometimes think of the big five as like the Rosetta stone. And mm -hmm. so you can take any model and if you could take any model and a attached it to the big five, you can kind of translate it into any other model. Mm -hmm. And so you go, well, here's how I understand psychopathy. Well, here's my model of narcissism. Oh, this is why they're similar and this is why they're different. So it really helps you understand things much more clearly. Well, well, uh, just as a kind of footnote here, but I think it's important. So it's important to remember with for listeners that um, the big five is a theoretical. So things like uh, Myers Briggs with Carl Jung has a, has, has a theory out of it. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but um, and there are other models that have um, this kind of um, some of the aspects of the theory, if it doesn't hold up, it's still kind of anchored down by that. And so the idea that um, in that sense, right, like uh, big five doesn't have you know, a Freud or a Jung or, you know, an Erickson or something like that. And in that sense, it's a theoretical, which is helping it to, to kind of have, um, uh, this way in which it can live in a lot of spaces, like you're saying, kind of like this yes, Rosetta Stone. A, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's lots of models of the big five, but they're not necessarily everyone's competing because it just, like you said, it sort of just floats out in space empirically mm -hmm. and people go, oh, this is my theory. This is mine. But it doesn't need the theory because it yeah. is this. Um, 
Yeah, Myers Briggs is a well. It's goofy because they they do this weird split in the middle. So they like if you you know you scored fifty one, you're on this side, and forty nine, you're on this side. So people always balance. It's just not how science yeah, works. And yeah, it's just using the discrete variables as opposed to the continuous ones. Yeah, and they have weird. these weird ways of grouping, which don't make a whole lot of sense aside from all the reliability validity stuff, which isn't really there, or it's very minimal. Yeah. So there's just a lot of problems with it. So to that end people become kind of quasi obsessed with personality measures, right? You'll see yes, people, they, they take them. it. They really love this. They like knowing about themselves, but not really. Yeah. And if it, if yeah. it's, if it says something negative, then it's like, well, that's not true. I must have, you know, it's, it's very funny how people do this, but you know, people would do this on Facebook. People do this on various sites. Um, you know, there'll be all these generators or things like that. You know, people, I'm sure you've, I mean, I do these for fun, just, you know, with, with friends or family or whatever. And so we know which Winnie the Pooh character are you? Yeah, and it's like, which, of, yeah, of course, I'm, house, you know, or, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm Al or Tigger or whatever, you know, and it's like when someone, you know, gets Eeyore, it's like, yeah, of course, you know, that makes sense, you know, <laughs> but you know, yeah. so there's all these like fun ones of sorts. And I just kind of see them as, you know, fun, but I, why, why do you think people, obsess over this kind of thing and and you know uh, and would you say the big five is kind of the really the the standard bearer for really measuring personality and why we shouldn't or we should be very careful i would say shouldn't but maybe you don't want to go that far why we shouldn't use myers-briggs or enneagram or some of these other oh, tests they, that don't yeah. hold up yeah i so i um the, the big five, like I said, is you want a general model that works well. Yeah. There's nothing magic about five. You could do a four-factor model. You could do a six-factor model, a seven-factor model. But we've been doing this for about 100 years, and five-factor sort of works. Mm -hmm. It's not perfect, but it sort of works for people. And what's beautiful about it is if you want to make get more specific, you can make it 10 aspects. Mm -hmm. Or you can go to the big two if you want. So mm -hmm. we can move this model up and down like a, like a, a um, you know, whatever. Uh, forget the word. Uh, yeah, Spyglass well, yeah. of some sort. It's cool. Yeah. It's a really flexible model. It just works wonderfully well. The Myers-Briggs is it's a it works in applied settings because you go you're like this and you're like this and mm -hmm. people go oh people are different and you go yeah that's the story we're all different <laughs> and that's a good lesson in, in our workplace you know so when you're you know when keith's getting crazy it doesn't mean he's really crazy it's just how keith is and so i think it's useful for that but in turn theoretically the jungian stuff the idea of sensing and you know feeling and and feeling it's, and, yeah. it's cool i mean it's it, yeah. because it's really like the basic way you engage with the world like do you feel it do you mm -hmm. emote it do you think it or do you kind of god vibe it right so i love that model but it it's not really what the myers-briggs is measuring and it's not it's just a fun model if you want to think about the human condition it's yeah I, I think of it kind of like science. my zodiac sign of sorts it, it, yeah, well a, i hate to yeah, I guess I would say that. I mean, it's that, not the same I, thing, but it's, no, it's but sort Jung of in that wrote world. A lot on this, Jung wrote a lot on the Zodiac, and he'd probably say that was okay. So I'll <laughs> say it's okay, too. <laughs> right. <laughs> in terms of narcissism in particular, so we've been talking about personality generally, but yeah. you, you give a few measures that are here. You give the uh, narcissistic personality inventory, the NPI. You yeah. talk about the hypersensitive narcissism scale, the HSNS, yeah. narcissistic vulnerability scale, grandiosity scale etc you yeah, know i gave it all yeah 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 it's, it's great i mean what are all of these different measures i mean i can tell that some of them are looking at you know either the grandiose or vulnerable one yeah but what about so the mpi what, the way measures work is they kind of come about historically and they evolve and change as the science goes what happened with narcissism is that the first measure that really caught on was called the narcissistic personality inventory npi and there were lots of different versions of this, but the 40 item measure kind of became the standard bearer for narcissism measures for about 30 years. Mm. So if you want to know your narcissism score and be able to compare it to norms, mm. where you have a lot of data, you take the NPI. So we have a lot of normative data, but over those 30 years, our understanding of narcissism changed. Our way to build scales has gotten better. So we've built different scales. The... Um, the other scale that's been around a long time is the hypersensitive narcissism scale, which is a measure of vulnerable narcissism. And it actually traces back to Henry Murray's work. 
yeah. and it's a, it's a, I can't remember all the items off the top of my head, but like I'm secretly put out when people ask me to, th- you know, care about their feelings. It's just kind of interesting self-centeredness. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I suggest that anybody, you know, just Google NPI or HSNS and take them for yourself or just read them. You can kind mm-hmm. of get a good sense of what they're measuring. Um, and now we're building scales that are, you know, trying to get at that trifurcated model. So we can take get a whole narcissism measure and then break it into subcomponents. So when we're looking at research, we can figure out, you know, what different aspect of narcissism is predicting this different behavior. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think that that's really helpful, but how would you see these measures as different from the ones that, you know, maybe someone like myself would use, right? So using an MMPI-3, a PAI, an MCMI-4, these are these are massive uh, yeah. uh, uh, personality measures that have many, many scales, many subscale, you know, clinical scales. I don't know if we still use the Harrison Lingo scales for the MMPI, but all these different types of clinical scales, and you, you need a, a a trained clinician or professional to give them and and but you're getting more robust data you're getting you know there's an interpretive thing that's necessary there kind of give just kind of the what you're talking about is the mpi which is a kind of quick and dirty 40 item that people can kind of do on their own but then you have these other ones that a psychologist has to use so what would you get out of one or the other i guess from these um so the reality is there's scales that you have to pay for, and there's scales that are free. And what academics have done over the years is trying to is basically try to make free versions of every scale you had to pay for because we don't have any money for research. <laughs> I, I'm straight. I mean, it's just no, it's, purely it's, economics. That's the reality. That's the reality. So <laughs> if I go do research on the MMPI, and there is an O'Brien. Uh, I think narcissism inventory off that that somebody did. I, I, if I remember that, I, I I have to pay for it. I don't have the money for it, or else mm-hmm. they're going to come after me and oh, for copyright issues, right? <laughs> yeah, they're <laughs> right. copyright. So no one does research on the MMPI because we can't get access to it, which is kind of tragic because you have that huge historic database and all that oh, yeah. work that went into it, yeah, yeah. and you have that broad clinical, like you're just saying, you have this broad clinical coverage. I would love to have that on every subject I ever looked at. Mm-hmm. I just can't pay for it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what we have been doing, and this is, you know, thanks to um, Lou Goldberg at, at Oregon starting this, but kind of making free inventories and then just building those with better and better quantitative data. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's the game. I'm sorry. It's just simple economics. No, I, that's, that's, that's the reality we live in. Yeah, I would say probably also, I think with maybe the major ones that are, you know, behind, you know, Pearson or whatever the other other testing overlords are, um, are, you know, they do have really good. I mean, I don't I can't speak for the other measures, but um, they they do have really good uh kind of item analysis, right? So when you're talking about like test construction and stuff like that, I mean, the items are fantastic because you can do all of the, um, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, looking to make sure that people aren't, you know, faking, right? So that you you can spot it really quickly. And, you know, there's all these ways of having internal consistency. And it's it's really great for that kinds of stuff. Because at some point, when people take enough of these, you can kind of sort of game it if you want to have a result that you want or something. Absolutely. You know, you're bringing up a a really important point Two two things. One is we have done research comparing the the NPI to the the narcissistic personality inventory to the clinical interview, the skin Mm -hmm, profile. mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They correlate pretty highly. Like that's great. They, they that's work great. pretty well. That's great. Um, that said, I think um, you know a clinical interview is preferable in any case because if you can dial in how people are reading the questions. The other thing you'll notice is what we do research. It's all on low stakes participants, which means mm. they don't care. I yeah. just I, I say, hey, fill this out. It's mm-hmm. not for a job. I'm mm-hmm. not a doctor. Mm-hmm. I mean, I am a PhD, but I'm not. A, it's not for a <laughs> mental hospital. Right, right. They're just doing this. They're like, yeah, I'll tell the truth. What do I care? And they don't think too much. Mm-hmm. So it works. Mm-hmm. But you take that and you go into a medical setting. And they're like, oh, my God, I can't say this right. I, because I might look like I'm schizophrenic. Mm-hmm. Or you go into a job search or whatever. So these yeah. I should have I should clarify that that our research is based on on participants who are not motivated to cheat yeah yeah no that's that's i think that's a really nice point because yeah if you do this in right a medical or forensic setting 
yeah, forget it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, but I, I think if it is low stakes, you know, it's like, yeah, sure. Why not? Yeah. I mean, I know I'm crazy anyways. Like, you know, people don't really care. You know, it's, it's, it's less, it's really low stakes. Um, yeah. it, just briefly, you, you talk about in the book about, you know, folks that have, you know, these narcissistic traits, you talk about some of their goals and motives. And we kind of mentioned this earlier. Um, you know, you talk about approach avoidance, you talk about extrinsic uh, and intrinsic motivations being important uh and then the role of self-regulation so maybe just chat about like what are what are these folks up to what are their motives here what are they just trying yeah. to like mess with people or what is it about themselves no. like, what's, what's going on i i uh, tell me if i get too heavy here because i don't i don't know your audience so you, no, just no, you can go as heavy as you want. either way you can go as heavy as you want <laughs> okay well you think about it this way all creatures kind of have a gas pedal and a brake pedal i mean a few very simple organisms just have a gas pedal but most creatures have a gas pedal and a brake pedal. They, they try to get goals, and we might call this approach orientation or appetitive function or dopaminergic function or mm -hmm. reward seeking or novelty seeking. They want stuff. Yeah. And the other part of them is like, I don't want, I want to be, I'm scared. I got to remove that threat, fight or flight. And we might call that avoidance, uh, motivation. Uh, somebody to call one behavioral activation, the other behavioral inhibition, like a mm -hmm. bis and bass system. But these two systems are just hardwired into all creatures. And it's mm -hmm. just how we're built. Yeah. With humans, you've got approach orientation is I want rewards. I'm looking for out positive outcomes. I'm thinking about success. And when that starts entering the self, how you think about yourself, it turns into I'm awesome. I'm going to win. I like to compete. Mm -hmm. So approach orientation funnels into the personality that's sort of aligned with grandiose narcissism. I'm going to mm -hmm. get this. I want this. Who's going to be the leader? Avoidance orientation, the brake pedal funnels more into vulnerable narcissism. They're mm -hmm. not going to see I'm a loser. They're not going to mistake, you know, they're not going to see my weakness, et cetera, more defense. Yeah. So you've got that basic wiring into the self. And then when you take the self, sorry about this barking. Uh, then when you take the self into the social world, you have to engage in self-regulation. And with more grandiose narcissism, if you're looking for achievement, status, success, I always boil it down to sex, status, and stuff. Mm -hmm. I want an attractive partner who shows how attractive I am and I want attractive material goods like cars or boats or planes or ships that show my power, or jewelry, whatever. Um, and, and I want status. I want to be famous. I want to be a leader. I want to be respected and well-regarded in the community. So mm. that is the classic set of goals for narcissism. It's not, I want to be nice. Mm -hmm. I want to be a better dad. You know, <laughs> I want to be more grounded, mm -hmm. you know. It's it's a, just a certain set of goals that we might call extrinsic goals. So in the motivational literature, you'd say that's like an extrinsic set of goals, fame, money, status, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the whole system, it's starting with this gas pedal, funneling through a sense of self that's a little inflated into a self-regulatory system that's looking for you know sex status and stuff to get higher power and greater sense of self-esteem and pride. Etc. Yeah, I think that that that's really important because you know people may be listening to this and say, okay, I I can follow that. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and then some people will say, well, why? Why are people looking for why? Where is this coming from? And then we point them back to the early part of the conversation. There's various theoretical models that kind of try to understand development of the self, development of personality. Um, then you have those other four models in terms of the cultural piece, the evolutionary psychology piece, etc. So those are kind of where you know they're not all not one better than the other, but <clears throat> they give a they give at least a framework of trying to understand psychopathology or 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 human personality to try and give some potential uh, uh, borders of of where people are kind of you know what's kind of pushing folks for some of these things, but on the actual evidence of things, it's it, you can see where people fall into these kind of places, right? Where it's like, yes, if you have the grandiose piece or the vulnerable piece, you know, what's going on, what's kind of animating them to do these things or to mm -hmm. kind of, you know, uh, uh, generate some of these ways of, uh, of, of behaving in the world. Yeah. It's, it's, if you're like 
uh, status seeking and self-centered and not that interested in loving relationships with other people. That's what you, you want fame and power and stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. if you're focused on other people, it would be a different goal set. You'd be like, I'm going to be connected. I'm going to be more engaged. You know, they're just, it's just a way you're wired and it goes down a path. Yeah. So let's just, wait, I know we talked about it earlier and we'll just spend real quick on this and then we can, I want to talk to you about the, uh, the dark triad. I'm, I'm real excited to talk to you about that. <laughs> so just real quick about narcissistic personality disorder. So we mentioned that it's a thing, it exists. Um, I just want to put a fine point on this because people will, I think, wrongly, inadvertently think that there's so many people out there with a personality disorder. And so I'm actually not even going to read for narcissistic personality disorder, right? Because I actually think that that's um, less relevant. So in, in my training, you know, we look and study all the di- disorders and diagnoses and things like that. But I had a uh, an analyst professor tell me, you know, all personality disorders are kind of the same, right? At their at their core, at their foundation of, of things, right? Is like, there, yeah, there's differences, and yes, you know, histrionic as opposed to schizoid, as opposed to you know, uh, dependent, but really there's these become not specifiers but they become just more of of how it kind of plays out and in fact if you look in the beginning of the dsm-5 <clears throat> which you know i have you know opinions about i'm sure you do too um but it, you know the the clinical bible if you will of how we diagnose there's a general uh, uh foundation that's there for all personality disorders Right. So um, I'll just read this real quick. So the general criteria, this is from the DSM-5, the most recent one. Um, the general criteria for a personality disorder is um, impairments in personality, self and interpersonal functioning, and presence of pathological personality traits. And so to diagnose a personality disorder, so any of the 10 right, that we still have, the following criteria must be met. So there's five criteria you have to have in order to meet any to this is what makes it a personality disorder as opposed to a mood disorder or a psychotic disorder or what have you so a significant impairments in self identity or self direction and interpersonal empathy or intimacy functioning b one or more pathological personality trait domains or trait facets c impairments in personality functioning and the individual's personality trait expression are relatively stable across time and and consistent across situations and d the impairments in personality functioning and the individual's personality trait expression are not better understood as normative for the individual's developmental stage or social culture environment and the impairments in personality functioning and the individual's personality trait expression are not solely due to the direct physiological effects of a substance or general medical condition so as you can see there it continuously says their personality functioning and their personality trait expression, which is what you were getting yeah. at earlier, across time, across situations, um, not normative for their social, cultural, or developmental stage. It's not because of a substance or some type of meds, and that there's impairments in self and interpersonal functioning, which goes back to some of the things you were saying earlier about. You know, did this person have some trauma early in life, a you know, serious abandonment? Did they have certain other things that were happening where, you know, because of a variety of things from a biopsychosocial model, could have just, you know, tipped that over? I mean, there's still a lot of unknowns, but the way I, what I just read, you just don't find a lot of people that fit all of those things. Having traits alone is not going to be enough, right? And so what you're talking about is a lot of these traits, but a personality disorder, again, we're talking less than 2% is, is really uh, pervasive. Yeah, it's a, it's a problem. Like people had recognized it's a problem. They're calling shrinks because it's a problem. They're calling attorneys because it's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that description you read is right. There's this foundational problem and then it's expressed, you know, with narcissism, with the traits, it's the, I think they, it's attention seeking and grandiosity. Maybe I'm trying to remember the new PID-5 model mm-hmm. and with other disorders, there'll be other traits, but mm-hmm. that fundamental dysfunction is kind of key to everything. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. So let's talk about the. There's there's four triads, right? So oh, there's we'll, so many triads. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's getting it's getting a little interesting here. So okay, let's start with the dark triad because I think that's what people yeah. know. So you just tell us the dark triad, and then I just have a few counters to this. So uh, yeah, oh, what's yeah. the dark triad? <clears throat> so uh, the dark triad is an idea by uh, a psychologist named Del Paulus up at British Columbia. 
But it was simply that certain variables go together, and he focused on these three, making it a triad. And he called them dark because what they shared was sort of trade antagonism. They were mm-hmm. sort of associated with meanness or callousness. Uh, some people have argued we should call this the antagonistic triad, which mm-hmm. would probably make sense as well. Totally understandable. And those three core traits he looked at were narcissism, which we've been talking about, uh, psychopathy, you know, which is narcissism. It's a lot like narcissism, but a little more impulsivity, a little less self-control, maybe. Mm. Um, less leadership, more, you know, criminal, but it's it's the same family of traits. And then this other trait, which is called Machiavellianism. And Machiavellianism, uh, the term comes from the book The Prince by Niccolo, Niccoli Machiavelli, mm-hmm. uh, where he was sort of giving advice for, mid, you know, mid- medieval, um, you know, court behaviors. And where you see it is things like Game of Thrones. So these really manipulative <laughs> figures like Littlefinger and Game of Thrones or whatever. Mm-hmm. So the, Game of Thrones, there's always these powerful figures behind the throne that aren't, they're not really self-centered. They're not really necessarily psychopathic. They're just manipulative. And that's mm-hmm. Machiavellian. And so the idea of the dark triad is these traits sort of swim together in a way. They're like cousins, maybe is another way to think about it mm-hmm. because they share that that core Mm-hmm. Uh, of of low of antagonism and people have also more recently made that sort of talked about a dark tetrad or you know with with adding sadism to that group mm-hmm. and sadism mm-hmm. is like self-centered and mean but you actually take joy and hurting pleasure people. yeah yeah, yeah whereas yeah. narcissism it's like yeah i'll run over people because i'm not interested in them as much as myself but it's not so much sadistic mm-hmm. except in you know malignant cases mm-hmm. sorry and and there's a there's also a, a a vulnerable dark triad which is again very similar it's in the same universe same world distant yeah. cousins or whatever yeah but yeah and so the idea of the vulnerable dark triad is you focus on that trait of neuroticism so it's these traits that are are sort of antagonistic but also neurotic and so in that what you see is vulnerable narcissism which is sort of that you know neuroticism antagonism you see um what they call factor two psychopathy, which mm. is the psychopathy that's more neurotic and more impulsive, um, a little more anyway. It's the it's a less charming form of psychopathy and and borderline personality, not disorder, but borderline personality traits. Mm-hmm. And so that borderline personality, you see a lot of you see a lot of neuroticism, especially instability in the self system. So mm-hmm. one thing that's really common with borderline is this, you know, your your sense of self changes pretty rapidly Mm -hmm. um you see that somewhat in vulnerable narcissism but it's not as extreme Mm -hmm. yeah so i guess but before we 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 go to the light triad and then the energized triad now one of the things that kind of bugs me um about this is that now, now granted i mean some of many of these qualities are um you know not not the best all the time but there are adaptive qualities to some of these pieces in the dark triad no i mean this is not all bad or or even that it has a valence at all i think that there's moments or situations where you do want a little bit of this right like if you're trying to um if you're trying to advocate for yourself to get a promotion at a job, you might want to use some. You don't want to, well, yeah. okay, I guess that's fine. I guess just just keep underpaying me for another five years. You want a little bit of this kind of antagonism, right? You want a little bit. Absolutely. Obviously, politicians are doing this all the time, but sometimes you want a little bit of that if you're going to make big, grand, sweeping social programs, right? You're not yeah. going to do that by saying like, well, whatever you guys want, and you know, I guess. Just just Who whip up whatever tell anybody what to do. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. You know, whatever. You know what I mean? Like, there's there is yes. some adaptive aspects to this. No, absolutely. No, I I am uh, I am I am not on the you know narcissism is evil bandwagon. That's why I've studied it so long. I never really liked entitlement. I st- I started studying entitlement and dropped it because it wasn't my thing. But uh-huh. I don't mind a big ego if somebody's willing to do some work. You know, I can <laughs> I can put up with that. <laughs> right. Um. So, yeah, I, I think there's a, I guess the sense is the focus on on sort of the, the, the more antagonistic or the more interpersonally harmful sides of these traits is a problem because you feel like you're going to be a victim of a narcissist, victim of a psychopath. You don't think, 
Yeah, I need this guy on my side. He's a little psychopathic. He's going to be great at sales. Let's put him in charge. <laughs> you know, right. but but that's how in real life you should think. You know, yeah. like I have a buddy. He's, like, he's actually moved, but I'm looking down the road. He's a, he's a brain surgeon. He's like, if I yeah, I kill people. He's like, I don't want to, but I do. And if I can't recover from that, the next day I can't do my job. Right. It's because I have to be a little callous. So that's just, and I'm mm-hmm. like, yeah, I get it. If I were cutting people's hearts, I'd have an ego too. It would be helpful. If I were like, oh, should I do it? It's mm-hmm. no, you're not helping anyone. You got to be confident and go for it. Mm-hmm. So I, I do think it's it's a it's a complicated dance mm-hmm. more mm-hmm. than just good or bad. Yeah, yeah, I, I like that. I would agree. Now I know I know Scott uh, Barry Kaufman. He's he's kind of you know he, he's you know Maslow two point He loves Maslow yeah. and and he's you know he's he's right. Transcend was a great book. I, I thought that was a fantastic book actually. Um, but he really he he has this idea of I think it's his idea right his uh, yeah idea the, of light the light triad, triad. Scott. So now you're going to ask me. I always forget. It's like Kantian and hu- humanism, and I get them all mixed up because we're all so happy. Yeah, it's, 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 they're very, they're very, they're very positive. It's a uh, humanism, such as so as I tend to treat other people as valuable. Yeah. Faith in humanity, tend to see the best in people, and Kantianism, I prefer yeah, honesty a, over charm. Yeah, and, that's the way I was Kantianism always confused me. But yeah, you've got honesty there. Yeah, uh, trust in other people, and so you're really capturing agreeableness. You know, just different yes. faces yes. of agreeableness in yes. there. Yeah, and and so. How how much uh, how much of this is I mean it kind of I, I know so I know the dark triad is kind of is, is definitely supported in the literature. How much is the light triad? It seems like it's still early goings. Oh, it's early. It's, yeah, it's still. I just I just was putting it in there for fun, just to show mm-hmm. people that you could kind of move these ideas. I like to move personality structures around. Well, I I think the the good thing about this triad is that it does seem rooted, which we there's there's a kind of just a explosion of, of research and 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 a lot of things written on um, the human capacity for cooperation so many people have written about cooperation in the past 10 years yeah. you know I think of you know Mike McCullough I think of Nicola Rehani I think of Nick Christakis like there's million so many people writing on this stuff and how cooperation you know humans cooperating with each other has helped us survive and thrive yeah. on the planet so I I feel I see a lot. So maybe it is rooted in kind of the kind of agreeableness at the core, but I see it as kind of like this cooperative nature is what is kind of like this halo around it that kind of like ties it together. Uh, I'd have to probably ask Scott personally, but it seems like that would make sense as well because then you can think of like the whole like prestige and dominance thing, like you need both or, you know, some people can use it or or whatever. And so the dark triad is definitely has adaptive qualities, right? And it's definitely Mm -hmm. negative. And I think the reverse, right? The light triad probably has some negative qualities too. It's not all good, right? You don't want to just be a doormat, a pushover. You're just always, you know, just blindly trusting people. And I don't think that's what the light triad says, but you could see where it has some potentially mal or um, uh, negative aspects to it. Yeah. Agreeableness, like you mentioned income, but there's pretty good data on that, that at least when you're asking for raises or looking at salary, people that are a little more antagonistic make more money. Mm -hmm. Uh, They're willing to ask for more. Yeah. You've got to be a little bit tough. I mean, that's the, that's just life. You've got Mm -hmm. to balance between those things. Um, I'm just thinking of the, the cooperation work and trying to I had really put those together and I'm trying to think why I'm different than Mike McCullough. I don't know. I guess that's sort of evolutionary thinking and big group thinking. Yeah. I'm just, he, yeah, he does. I, from what I remember um, reading his book and when we, we had a really nice conversation. It's been a minute though. It's been at least uh, a year. Yeah. I think it's been almost a year. Um, yeah. He's definitely in more, he's closer to the kind of evolutionary psychology kinds of stuff. Um, so it's rooted in, in those things. So but yeah, humans are, ra- I mean, the idea that we have 300 million people in this country that get along pretty freaking well, except on Twitter. Yeah. And no. most people, like if I go, if I drove a hundred miles in any direction and walked into a grocery store and said, Hey, people, I'm in the South. So maybe it's different, but people would say, hi, and I could make a friend and we'd all get along fine. And we get in line and no one's going to beat me up. <laughs> it's, it's remarkable. Yes. It's really remarkable how wonderful the world is and how humans 
are so great. Well, well, yeah, and I think you see this in certain fictionalized accounts as well, you know, TV shows and movies. But yeah, it's the same for me. Anytime, you know, I'm up here in northern Appalachia and western Maryland, and if I go around the country, and then when I've gone to different places in the world, you know, it's more or less, you know, there's cultural differences and stuff, but at the human quality, yeah, people will be like, oh, it's it's this, or it'll help you out, or whatever. Yeah. Um, tip, typically, I think that that's what you see. Um, obviously, there's so many you know nuances to that. Uh, you also talk about the Energize Triad, which, you know, you, you just kind of, you, you throw I it in there. So I yeah. just wanted people to think of that energy piece, which is mm-hmm. interesting because one of the traits that with grandiose narcissism, you have this, this assertiveness and energy. And another trait that goes with that, and they talk about this in business literature more, is hypomania. Mm-hmm. It's kind of this low level of, of mania, which is more like pure extroversion. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of an interesting piece. And another one that, that kind of lines up with that is like boldness or fearless dominance. Sometimes they talk about it in psychopathy, but mm-hmm. just people who are just really uh, Chuck Yeager, you know, the old the fi- test pilot, mm-hmm. not, mm-hmm. A, not a narcissistic guy, not a bad guy, but not not the greatest guy, just mm-hmm. a guy who liked to do cool stuff, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. just pure energy. So that's mm-hmm. kind of that more energized piece, mm-hmm. which I find I find a little bit more appealing because it's not as socially toxic as uh-huh. the, as the yeah. uh, and it can be, you know, my extroversion hurts my relationships at times, but not as bad as antagonism does. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was really, really cool to see kind of how you can, how these things can kind of have these uh, different kind of wheels going. And it's like, oh, you know, this, you, you once, I think if people read that, you know, chapter in the book, they'll see, yeah, this stuff's really complicated. It's in a lot of things. This isn't just a kind of, you know, uh, one box here, one box here, black and white kind of thing. There's a lot of stuff going on in the relationships. So, so let's talk real quick about the uh, kind of the middle part of the book, I guess. Um so this is more of the applied stuff. So I'm sure people that have been listening up to this point have been thinking, when are we getting to social media? When are we getting, when is that part of the conversation? Come on. And we're getting there. We're almost there. So I guess first, um, so, I mean, narcissism in relationships can be really tough. I mean, really, really, really tough. I mean, I'm sure listeners can think about certain people in their family, you know, those, those, you know, that uncle or that aunt or that cousin that I see in the holidays or whatever. And so you you talk about it in the the one chapter in the book about that they tend to place less focus on commitment, compassion, connection, and more on association, admiration, and domination. So, so how how do, I mean, I know you don't, you're not in the clinical or whatever, but just, just kind of, you know, uh, practically, I mean, how do people navigate you know, this stuff and they work with these folks. I mean, that's, that could be challenging. Yeah. So I I guess the one way to think about this is that people often want two different things in a relationship. They want somebody who's attractive and and successful and high in status and looks good. And, you know, they'll be happy to show their mom and tell their friends about. Right. Um, and they want somebody who's kind and compassionate and cares about them and they can trust and is a moral good person. And both those things matter. Yes. But the way we date in the U.S., the way we, we assort, assort is we, we get attracted to the more superficial extroverted status traits first. So we look at people's looks. That's number one. And then we look at maybe what they do and how much money they have. And then if they're charming and fun. And then we go, are they nice? So that sort of comes up a little later. And so what happens in the in the relationships world is narcissists who are really focused on that first part, the looking good, high status, you know, flexing whatever you've got, they do really well because they're judged as very attractive if you're focused more on those sh- more short-term qualities. So it screws up everything. So let me ask let me ask on this point then. So if we're being honest now, I know this stuff gets a, a really bad kind of image and stuff in, 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 in general in society. But so on my, my, I mean, I have many, uh, uh, uh clients and I, obviously I know people personally that, um, you know, are on the dating apps. I mean, that's the, 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 yeah. the first stop to dating in the 21st century. Right. Um, I, I don't know what that's like. I, 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 I last so time, I, yeah, I, mean, me too. I was before all that time. Right. So, but, um, 
you know, I, I, no one likes it. I never, no one, oh, yeah, it's a great thing. No one, no one says that. Everyone says it's terrible. Um, but it, is it, it does feel my impression. Again, I, I don't have experience with this, but my impression is that it's very, um, I guess you could say superficial in some sense, but it's also a lot of objectifying and a lot of discrimination. Isn't that what's happening? Like you see somebody's profile and you're swiping left or swiping right. And it's based on whatever picture, whatever the, you know, 50, whatever characters, whatever is in the profile. Yeah. And you're just making like snap judgments based on how good they look or how good they don't look. Or, you know, you're discriminating between like, you know, whatever it is, whatever your preferences are. I mean, isn't that what it's, 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 you know, pushing those types of ways of dating? that, that apps that have you treat people like a commodity that you sort on a rank and then select or reject and that focus on short-term looks and 50 word descriptions you think that pulls for narcissism i mean i mean like right that's like your narcissism machine right and so i mean and you just add some cocaine and a disco and you you got the whole package (laughs) that's for the older listeners (laughs) so i mean but how how do you how do you navigate that, right? I mean, that's the world you live in. You can't, people don't know how to date without those things. That's the problem because the problem is you're looking for a committed emotional relationship, right, but right. you're attracted to people who are shallow but look good on an app. Right. You're just going to get burned over and over and over. Right, right. Yeah, and that, I mean, that's it's hard. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a... <laughs> It's like it's a, terrible. it's like a, it's like a labyrinth you're trying to navigate through where it's like, oh, well, this looks like the way out. It's like, oh shit, that's another dead end. Okay. Go back and try to retrace yeah. it. Like it's, it, I, I mean, I, I always have some type of, of, of empathy for people like that. Cause it's really, really difficult. And people are looking for connection and meeting. The ironic Absolutely. thing is, is that everyone or not everyone, but a lot of people that use those apps, they're all looking for connection and intimacy, but no one's actually doing right. it. I, I used to call it the sizzle and the steak problem. It's like we want the sizzle, but we need the steak or something. Yeah. But I don't yeah. even know if that metaphor works. But what we're attracted to isn't the thing that nourishes us in a relationship. Right, 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 right. And so and so that's I think these system is horrible. I mean, I would probably probably be better to go back to matchmaking or or (laughs) at least dating friends of friends or something Mm -hmm. it's this is very hard and uh people who do well in this these apps are more narcissistic i mean Mm -hmm. i can't point to data on that but i'm confident not enough to say it would be that the 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 things that i usually say when when people bring this up is i usually tell them i would just have an all options kind of approach you know Use a little bit of the apps, take it for what it is, meet people out in the real world at a party, friend of a friend, whatever, um, you know, just, just have an all options approach. Don't not do it, but don't only do that. You know, I think it, it helps to just kind of um, not get stuck in one kind of bucket. Uh, yeah, at least, at I, least you have something there. I, I mean, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole, but I've asked my students about this and I said, well, don't you just go talk to people? At- yeah say hi and yeah they're like we don't do that very much yeah you, and, and you, that's what makes me a little nervous now, i don't know if that's true or not but well i think a lot of people in certain contexts yeah they're, they're less likely to do that because it's it's a little bit strange now it's just like well what do you want why are you <laughs> why are you yeah. coming to me right <laughs> it's, it's, it's strange I, anyway I, I i don't like this system i think it it when you thin relationships you make them so thin and mm-hmm. the way you, when you channel them through these media you, you're kind of pulling for the dumbest stuff you're pulling for the yeah. shallowest stuff and yeah well, getting, it's, it's flattening people and you're just getting the avatar right yeah. and like that's not yeah. that's not it's not real you know and it's like and it, it's hard to know you know one way or the other so we, we talked a little bit about leadership right and you talked yeah. about uh leadership with emergence and effectiveness you know yeah. how, how are these uh how are these essential and maybe you can talk about the energy clash model oh yeah it, it's um in the in the study of leadership which has gone on a long time there's kind of there's a couple of really big variables that people are interested in one is this leadership emergence which is hey we got a group of people who's going to become the leader mm-hmm. or you know we've got a family business who in the family is going to end up running the business mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. who at who at the ge is going to be the next manager so mm-hmm. people are really interested in that 
Uh, and they're really interested in how good leaders are, leadership effectiveness, how good they are at decision making. And, and leadership is essentially motivating a group to a goal. That's the easiest way to think about it. Um, and so what you see with uh, with narcissism is that it predicts leadership emergence. Uh, it predicts leadership emergence in groups of strangers. It predicts it in family businesses. It predicts it in management and organizations. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that uh, people who are narcissistic have that assertiveness and that mm. energy. It's that more extroversion piece. They're willing to do what it takes to get there. And also, they're just motivated to be in charge more because mm. it's higher power, higher status, higher visibility, higher wealth, and power mm. over people. So what you'll find in any system is that narcissism gets pulled to the top. Mm. But when you look at actual effectiveness, you don't see narcissists and more effective leaders. What you see is they're more variable leaders or they're more willing to take big risks. Mm. So maybe it's, you know, I'm willing to cut all the employees. I'm willing to do a big merger with another tech company. They'll get me on the cover of the Wall Street Journal, et cetera. In life, you don't know what the heck you're doing. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. It's basically luck. I hate to break it to people. You know, famous <laughs> people got lucky. Mm -hmm. If they get lucky, everybody goes, they're a hero. They get lucky again. They're like, they're a corporate genius. and They write a book. If they fail, they go, it's hubris and they're idiots, you yeah. know, but then they dust themselves off and go do it again somewhere else. So mm -hmm. it, it predicts this variability, which in a certain way looks like success. Mm -hmm. Because mm. they're the ones writing the books. And yeah. Um yeah, I think when I wrote the narcissism epidemic, um, I, I was talking about Trump versus a guy, Don Brent, who's a big developer out in Irvine, Cal Orange County, California, who's got more money than Trump, but no one knows who he is because mm -hmm. he doesn't, he's just not arrogant. Mm -hmm. You know, he just kind of does his job and lives his life. Um, and so you what happens is we sort of attach success to arrogance because we see the arrogant people promoting their success we mm. don't see the humble people so we it gets yeah. distorted that it, narcissism is necessary for leadership it's not but mm. it's useful for emerging mm. yeah I, I, there's a lot of i you think you mentioned in the book there's a lot of um good research on this stuff in out of the uh, io literature the industrial organizational exactly. psych uh, stuff and that's i mean that stuff's been going around i mean what is a uh, scientific management theory back to taylor in the in the 1915 or whatever and he's kind of one of the first you know and yeah, so there, there's Taylorism. that's cool yeah they they you know but really it's you know 60s 70s 80s until t and currently i mean it's it's um i mean it's not some of it's not sexy but i mean i think it's really interesting the the it's work that's done on business yeah and they have jobs if anybody wants to go in and get a job oh yeah industrial oh, psychology yeah. Yeah. oh yeah oh yeah yes yeah. it's, um, it's, it's it's great it's great but they they did a lot of the earliest personality i mean the earliest personality tests were military you know like shell shock yep. Yep, but yep, after yep. that a lot of it was industrial mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. yeah it's really i find the research really interesting uh mm -hmm. it's, it's just very interesting okay so social media so um I mean, we talk for hours about this. Yeah, I guess I, I, so. <laughs> you know it's it's hard to kind of find a a a a, a point here, but well, I guess my here's my here's my piece on this. So there's the obvious stuff, right? You know, uh, you know, social media with you know Twitter, and definitely Instagram and TikTok now, and all these things. Yeah. I guess there's like um, so I know some of I know some of um Gene's work on this. And, and I know John Haidt has kind of, you know, come on board with some of that too. And I, I mean, I, I guess I could talk to either one of them, but it, it just, just in your mind, for me, I don't know. I did. There's definitely a there there, but I feel like social media becomes the punching bag all the time. And it's always like, we're trying to find the correlations. And I wonder how much, how strong is the correlation between social media use how frequent, how much, volume, et cetera, and um, rates of, of uh, you know, narcissism or other mental health challenges, you know, is that just a really over the top? Everyone's like, yeah, of course it is. And like, look at all these things. Or is it one of those, like, is that exaggerated? How strong is that link between social media use and, you know, stuff with more, you know, vanity or, or narcissism or any antagonism or the kind of grandiose pieces? How strong is that link, I would ask? So 
the the reason you don't see me talking with Gene and John about social media anymore is it's it's very complicated, hmm. and I gave up. I just was like, I can't explain this to, I talked to reporters. I'm like, it's complicated in yes. a lot of ways. So the way you're asking your question, there's two ways I could answer that. One, if I sampled a thousand social media users, are people more narcissistic, using it more, have more connections, et cetera? And the answer is, I know they have more connections. They're probably using it more, but it's hard to get time data and to really know what time is. Mm. Um, but they'll self-report they're using it maybe a little more. Uh, but they'll definitely have more connections on social media. So that that we've replicated, I mean, meta-analysis, that's sure. going on. Sure. Then the question, another question is when we had the world and we throw and we threw social media on it, did that make people narcissistic because they kind of jumped into this social media sort of micro metaverse? Yeah. And uh, and that means we need to know how narcissism is changing and social media use. And then mm. we have to guess. Mm. Um, when we first looked at this, oh, my gosh, this is 15 years ago. I started thinking, yeah, that's what's going on. Because you, you saw the early data showing people with, with their own. I mean, this is way back before anyone remembers. But when people had personal web pages, more narcissism. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. with individualized uh, emails, more narcissism. So I thought, well, that makes sense. And the data sort of look like that. Um, and then what we noticed in about 2013, people started getting really depressed and it sort of changed. Yeah. And then when I, I looked at the more longitudinal data of like, hey, let's watch people over time and see if their narcissism is going up or down with use. It's not really doing either. It seems mm -hmm. like people's narcissism is being maintained maybe mm -hmm. by social media. But it's not making everybody narcissistic, which mm. is, again, something I thought could have happened. Mm. But then you start thinking about what social media is, and it's a creative task. People are putting out content. Well, what happens in creative economies? You get an 80-20 rule or a, what a Matthew principle or mm -hmm. uh, however you want to call it, to call that, that function where um, – a very few set percent of people, 10%, are doing everything. They're getting the attention. They're putting out maybe it's 20%, whatever it is. And the other people are watching and feeling jealous yeah. or entertained. So you end up with a weird economy such that if you're really narcissistic and really do well on social media, you're going to feel good because mm. you're winning you know, in this competitive place. But all these other people are going to feel bad because they're like, my God, look at Javier. He's got this great life. He's got these kids. He's high five and I'm a freaking loser, you know, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to say anything. Mm -hmm. And look how skinny he is, man. He's lifting weights. And I'm so, <laughs> I'm like a little skinny dude. And, and, uh, I'm so weak and I, and, and I'm FOMO and social mm -hmm. comparison processes. So what happens is on average, maybe nothing happens, but maybe mm -hmm. these people get really happy and these people get really sad. Mm -hmm. So, it gets really complicated because on top of that, it's historical yeah. because it keeps changing. And part of that change is because of self problems. So lots of young girls were on Instagram, but that became very competitive. So they started moving to Snapchat yep. because it wasn't as much pressure as Instagram. Then they started moving to Finstagram. And now people are on TikTok, and that's not as much social pressure because it's sort of silly. Mm -hmm. So people are, are sort of running away from the from the social pressure of some of these more narcissistic environments. I think so. It's mm -hmm. it's very this is a very hard question, is what I'm saying. No, no, you know, uh, I I didn't know your opinions on it, and oddly enough, we we converge here. Um, oh. uh, we, <laughs> um, yes, I. I'm not close to this literature, but what I have read, I've read a few meta analyses. My understanding is that, like everything, it's really complicated and it's hard to factor in and factor out certain variables to know which is which. There's definitely something going on, but I think over time, I think because, so back to what I said in the beginning, when I read the, the book you wrote with, with Gene, yeah, I was like MySpace. I was like, oh God, I, was like, I haven't thought about MySpace yeah. in forever. You know, even, I mean, I don't, I don't have facebook anymore and so it's like oh, i mean I, I know people still do obviously but um you know it's and it's just so different even from 15 years ago and i wonder this is where i kind of have questions at least of so the landscape was different then the landscape is broader now and there's more people involved and people have it's it's not even just like 
people are acclimated to it. I mean, it's become a part of our society. It's become a part of our life, right? Yeah. Like some, there, you will not find a person um, in you know a major city or whatever around the world that doesn't have one of these things. Right. I mean, it's just it's how many users are there in Facebook? Is billions or whatever? Yeah. You know, there's and there's people that are on YouTube, which is a whole other world and. Now you have things like Discord and Twitch and things like that. Obviously, like you said, you know, Snapchat, TikTok is very big. I don't understand TikTok. Uh, I'm definitely sounding old now. I, yeah. I, 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 my daughter tells it to me and explains it to me. And I'm like, that's a lot of stimulus on the screen. I don't, I don't know what's going on, <laughs> um, but it's very popular. People really, really like it. Again, another footnote here, the whole data uh, sovereignty thing here and the trafficking of data that's going on particularly in TikTok and other places is quite alarming um that's a whole other it's a whole other conversation yeah. discussion but so you know it, my view is that like just the landscape has changed the the horizon is bigger like it's just different now than than, than 2010 you yeah. know it's just different so it's hard yeah. to say yes it's making people more narcissistic or more of this this and this it's like well is it i mean sure like what you're saying some people sure they're the ones that get all the followers and the retweets yeah. and the likes and the shares and then the other people that don't or whatever but i think it, it's kind of it's, it's there's a kind of averaging out now where it's like well if everyone's kind of in this and using it people have different ways of using it or people have you know different ways of interacting with it and so i don't know if 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 you can make those those same correlations you made 10 years ago yeah it's a cultural it's a culture it's a changing cultural question not just a classic mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. old school psychological question um the sense i get just talking yeah is that it's really rewired people's brains especially kids and they don't oh, yeah. do anything because they're always it's like the panopticon they're always being mm -hmm. filmed mm -hmm. and my brother sent me a, some, a high school video somebody gave him from his 90s high school in corona de mar and i looked at this video and everybody's smiling everybody's happy now i remember the 90s it wasn't like everybody was happy it was Prozac <laughs> right. nation time but when you watch this video everyone's they're just having fun and they're not sitting there worried what everybody freaking thinks about them. Yeah. And so I think that something that's going on is we've put ourselves in a panopticon or a, you know, con under constant surveillance. And we didn't sign up for it, but we did. Yeah. And it make it's making us kind of miserable and constantly, you know, think about how we're presenting ourselves. So I, I think there's something kind of not too good going on but it's not as simple as just narcissism or yeah. individualism or something it's yeah the the the, the my my unfinished thoughts on this i've thought about it in different ways that there's a few things i pull from on this is one is i just think we have access to too much information so we we haven't learned i think that's a good thing to have access to information but it's it's also really bad because we we haven't learned I think the the analytical or cognitive skills to parse all of that out. We just we yeah. just, just we just haven't learned that, so it becomes. It's not surprising that we have you know people that are controlled or or motivated by fear with conspiracy theories and misinformation and things like that. I mean, I I, I get it on that framework. Um, second is the same thing: access to anybody anywhere you know, at all times, millions of people or thousands of followers. Again, that's just, that's a strange, like I, I tried to explain this to somebody the other day. Let's say you have, let's say, let's just keep it low. Let's say you have 5,000 followers on Instagram or Twitter or whatever, right? Imagine a room. Now I can think of a room. Uh, there's a venue not far from me that has hold 6,000 people. Imagine if that whole thing was sold out 6,000 people are in there and they just put on a big screen my tweets or my my pictures or whatever and it's like holy shit oh yeah. my god and nobody like kind of grounds it in that in a kind of like an actuality but yeah. that's what's happening like if, if i send a tweet or or if you do and you know i think i have like just under four thousand followers so it's like whatever but i think about that i am like there's pot there's at least potentially four thousand people yeah and i know people that have you know uh 10 and 20 and fifty thousand people and i've talked to some people that have bigger accounts that have um over 100 
and they've told me, you know, particularly Twitter, Twitter looks different after like 110, 115,000. It, it just looks, it doesn't look how it does with like 10,000. It looks very different. Notifications are weird because it's like, a, you just there's never, it's always on. And, you know, your messages are always like just popping. Like it's just a, it's a stranger, different place. So yeah, I just think having that much access to people, um, all, all of the information and, and then the, just the speed of it. I mean, when you think about how technology worked until, I mean, really 1995, really, I mean, but maybe 90, if you want to be, you know, a little bit more liberal, you got information in three ways, TV, radio, and phone. Like that was, that's how you got things, right? Um, books. And, or yeah, and books magazines. or newspapers or, or like uh, um, the, the physical pieces. Yeah. But in terms of electronics, you heard on the radio, yeah. watched on TV, you got on the phone. Now it's like you can get on your watch and a phone and a tablet and three computers and two screens. And, you know, it's, you know, you got the Siri and, and the Alexa and like, it's just a lot. And like that happened in 10 years. Yeah. That's it's so insane. fast. That's yeah. so fast because for the whole 20th century, you know, if it wasn't physical uh, mediums, it was in three others, phone, in, uh, um, phone, radio, and TV. And then, yeah, the physical newspaper or books or whatever, like that's, it was just, and that's not a, I'm not trying to say it's a bad thing, but I think we're, we, we've, we've done all the really cool discovery and advancement, which is great. And now we're trying to catch up with like norms. We're trying to catch up with ethics. We're trying to catch up with all these things and like this never ending social experiment. <laughs> Dude, it's like the printing press. I mean, I yeah. don't know your age, but I'm like, you know, it's the last generation before the internet. I, I'm grateful yes, for I that. Time because for I, I mean, at least I got to read a book and learn how to template my thoughts differently before I started getting the network. Yeah. Um, and this is such an amazing and enormous change. It's just hard to even describe. It's the end of expertise because all the academics online, they're just like, well, suck it, Campbell. <laughs> like, oh, man, right. I thought I was okay. <laughs> and nobody cares. Um you know, you get it, it just everything is collapsing. Everything is collapsing into the network. All our institutions, which are hierarchical, the uh, universities, but yeah. medicine, you know, you go to your doctor and he's like this. You're like, dude, I just looked it up in your line. Right, <laughs> right, right. It's just like and the doctor hates you, but you're right. And right, so right. my point is, I think that we're we're in for a major we're in the middle of a major restructuring and it's. You yeah. know, I guess theoretically with generations theory, we've got till 2030 or so, 29, but I think it, who knows, but yeah, yeah that's the cycle for turning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think it's, it just seems faster in some ways, but you know, maybe that's, Dude, I'm just too kidding. much. I, I mean, this is I, I too much. Now, but <laughs> I do remember I was, I'm one of the last generations to, to remember, uh, before internet and, uh, yeah, I think that's, what's so interesting is that things were so much slower and how you would get things. And, yeah. you know, now it's, you're expecting every two years or definitely every five, but every two to three years, a new thing, like it's a whole, and it's, it's, that's a weird thing to get used to. That wasn't how it was when I was younger. No. So I guess, uh, to end things here. So we've talked about many of the negative aspects of, of narcissism. We've talked about some of the adaptive ones as well, but at the end of the book, you talk about how to use narcissism, narcissism strategically, which is what I was getting at earlier. Um, and you have these five you know, rules, if you want to call them that for managing narcissism, which is a nice way of saying it, you know, keep it brief, keep it in public, make the first move, build a network, stand up for yourself. Maybe just talk Ooh, about I like how those. We... I couldn't remember what I said. That's <laughs> good. Yeah. That's all good. Right. Who wrote yeah, those? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wrote this. Yeah. Um, yeah, so just talk about how we manage or you know strategically our narcissism so it's not kind of spilling out all the time in, in yeah. negative ways. So what you'll see in life is there's certain areas or aspects where if you've got confidence and ego and energy, hey, I'm Keith, I'm fucking stoked to be here. It's great to meet you. You know, I'm feeling good. Where does that where does that kind of energy work? And there are places where it, it's good. Like you want to be more like somebody who's narcissistic. I remember I did one of those Ted Ed talk or Ted, you know, Ted X, you know, kind of the mm -hmm. baby Ted talks. Mm -hmm. And you go on that stage, you're like, God, I wish I had a bigger ego. 
because <laughs> whenever I get, I've got, I'm pretty extroverted, but it always takes me a second on stage. I always, mm-hmm. I got to click for a second. Oh mm-hmm. God, I look at these people. Okay, boom. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. But if it were just more like, hey, everybody's for me, of course they are. Mm-hmm. Um, so narcissism is really good when you meet people initially, that's sort of that short term. So cocktail parties, uh, job interviews, mm-hmm. uh, executive training. I mean, we've looked at, we've looked at literally executive coaching or executive leadership uh, assessment institutes and mm-hmm. people will select for narcissism because of the confidence and drive and ambition. Mm-hmm. Um, it's good for, so it's good for short term. It's good for being in public. It's good for emerging as a leader over time. Um, it's good for building broad social networks. It's like make, like on social media, Twitter networks, you know, having mm-hmm. some ego and saying, Hey, mm-hmm. I'm going to, Tweet to Javier, even though I've got 10 followers, he's going to think I'm cool. Like you do that enough, it's going to work. <laughs> right. So, That's right. Yeah. You know, you can, I've seen it on Twitter, like kids with a lot of ego kind of run up the, they'll run up the status hierarchy. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so it can work for building a shallow network. Um, uh, I'm not sure what I missed on the list. Good for getting a date too. Um, Where, no, but you were saying like, brief and public first move right on the on the day yeah, that's, that's yeah. right yeah and then yeah. in building a network and, and standing up for yourself which we mentioned yes earlier. yeah so i think all those areas are really important and when you're in those areas you're like i can have an ego mm-hmm. what happens with ego is let's say you're an actor and you have your ego on stage and then you go home and you have your ego with your camera crew and you have mm-hmm. your ego with your co-stars mm-hmm. and then Later in the performance, the cameraman says, you know, I could make look Keith look good or I could make Keith look bad. What do you think <laughs> I'm going to do to that arrogant SOB? <laughs> and your co-stars go, Keith is a freaking diva. I'm never working with him again. You've got to cast Javier in the next movie. We're going to get rid of him as Captain Strange or whatever. <laughs> so, you know, or you start a relationship and you've got this great looking girlfriend and it's great. And then you go, I'm going to go get another girlfriend because I'm so awesome. I can have two. And you screw it all up mm-hmm. and, you, and you end up losing half your money. So the narcissism, that interpersonal piece is what bites you in the ass. So it's like if you can remember to be kind to people, respect people, help people, think about other people's needs, <laughs> right. you know, just right. those little, but that Dude. goes such a long way oh, with yeah. people. Yeah, absolutely. And when you're building a career at the beginning, being narcissistic can help. Mm-hmm. But over time, that people will find it out and they won't want to be with you. They won't want to do deals with you because they won't trust you. Mm-hmm. And everything's going to be harder. Like, uh, anyway. There's people yeah. you don't want to do deals with, and there are people you shake their hands. And if you're a handshake deal guy, you can get make a lot more money because no one has to do all the work. Mm-hmm. So my point is narcissism is good in these little ways, but long term, it, it, it'll hurt you. Yeah, 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 absolutely. You you talk about uh tor- again towards the end, you know, kind of, you know, for for people that are trying to change. You know, let's say people have you know their their yeah. narcissism traits are a little bit on overdrive, right? It's just mm-hmm. too much, or it's you know. So you know, you talk about there's different types of therapies you can do. So psychodynamic, um, you know, yeah. cognitive behavioral, and then there's you know a uh, 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 variance from that. You know, DBT, ACT, all of the all the yeah. alphabet soup. Um, yeah. And then there's you know. Obviously, we have different types of meds, so SSRI sometimes, or um, there's some more alternative treatments. You know, there's you know, ketamine. You know, there's different um, uh, different types of ways in which yeah. it's microdosed under psychiatric med- uh, management. Of course, no one's uh, talking about doing this on your own. And then you, you talk about some of the the you know where we're going, right? So you talk about you know we have a TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which yeah. is really really. Um, uh, promising in some ways, psychedelics. I mean, psilocybin, you know, uh, is is very promising. MDMA is used for uh, folks that have PTSD and some VAs, etc. And then some of the virtual reality stuff, um, which is also really really interesting. So, you know, you talk about these different ways in which people can, you know, if they want to, you know, get some some type of management, you know, using therapy or alternative forms. That there's other things that are are out there as well. Yeah, I I think it's really important. Like, people have issues with narcissism. They might not say, I'm a, I don't have MPD, but maybe, you know, I'm too self centered. My sense of entitlement's so high. I I don't feel, I could feel conflicted a lot. Um, Personally, I get so extroverted that I'll just talk over people at times. Like, I'm just blah, 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 and people can't express themselves. They kind of, it's kind of a turnoff. 
um, or people can be really insecure. Like uh, people are going to, you know, that defensiveness you see with vulnerable narcissism. So it's really important is you you kind of figure out where your issue is and you work on that. So you're not mm. like, I have to change my whole self. Right. But if my issue is I'm kind of a jerk or I'm, I may be entitled. Well, if you're entitled, maybe focus on gratitude. Just do a gratitude <laughs> journal. You don't have to do like you don't have to change the world. Just make yeah. it a practice or mm -hmm. um you know, if you want to be more compassionate, just every day, I'm going to be kind of my kid. I'm just going to do it every day and just make it a goal. So little things like that. I, you know, my, my big issue was driving. I get so enraged driving. I'm a pretty mm -hmm. chill guy, but I drive like everybody's an idiot. And mm -hmm. I've just been talking to myself for about six months now. And I mm -hmm. finally got it under control. Six mm -hmm. months of self-talk. I'm so much happier. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, and with things like neuroticism, you know, you can do classic therapies or exercise or meditation or SSRI. So whatever it is, you kind of find where your, your issue is and try to target that with something small. Beyond that, obviously therapy is great. It's just mm -hmm. do it. And what I've seen in the literature is there's no magic therapy no. and we don't have enough research to tell you, even if there is one, so just find somebody you like and give it a shot and try to <laughs> stick right. with it. That's right. That's yeah. probably it. Stick with yeah. it. Somebody you like and hope it works. That's right. Um, the psychedelic therapies are really interesting and we have some very recent work on ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. uh, but what you'll see with the psychedelics is a really, I think, mostly impactful on uh, neuroticism, sort of lowering neuroticism. Yeah. And helps with insecurity, agreeableness maybe a little bit, but it comes and goes. And extroversion sometimes goes up, which mm. makes sense if you think about like depression. So I don't think it's like a great treatment for narcissism because unfortunately what happens sometimes is people have these experiences and come back like a guru. Mm -hmm. So I think <laughs> yeah. it's good for neuroticism, but 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 the one uh, compound I think is really interesting is MDMA. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea that it's, a, it's an empathogen. Yeah, And so if you could use something like that, because it's great with uh, PTSD, as is ayahuasca, mm -hmm. um, but something that's really uh, empathogen, I think, has the potential. You know, and, and Timothy Leary was doing those prison studies, you know, psychopathy back in the day. So I think people yeah. are doing this work. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, yeah. but mostly it's just like, don't worry about your whole personality structure. Just see, hey, this is... In this little aspect of my life, my ego screwed me up, my antagonism, and just try to work on that one piece, soften that one piece. Yeah, yeah. And build from there. No, I, I think that that's very, very instructive. And some people feel like they have to do a whole personality shift, which is impossible and it's not really necessary. It's, there's these certain aspects that we just need to regulate probably much better. And a lot of narcissism is positive. You know, you're that's confident, right. yeah. you're driven, you're active. You don't need to get rid of that. You that's can right. still think you're attractive. Who cares? <laughs> right. As long as you're not a jerk, just, don't be, just be nice. That's, that's right. it. Right, right. That's right. Well, look, uh, the book is called The New Science of Narcissism. It's in uh, uh, hardcover. It's in paperback now. It's everywhere. Um, Keith, where can people find you and find your research? Um, probably the, you know, wkeithcampbell.com is a website, but my research is on Google Scholar. Yeah, that's Keith Campbell easy. at Google Scholar that's, and you'll find great. it all. That's the yeah. easiest way. Yeah. Well, well, thanks so much for, for coming on the, the podcast. This was such a fun conversation. I really, really enjoyed it. Thanks. That was really fun for me too. I, I, we got a lot heavier than I thought. That was cool. <laughs> no, that's great. No, I, I like to go deep, deep dive into it. So I, I, yeah. uh, I can't say enough thanks. So I really appreciate it. Good. You're good. Right.